All right. Voice is getting heard. There's probably a shitload I could rant about right now, but I'm not into it. But I'm into getting people heard. Got the turkeys behind me. Chickens are gone in the freezer. Turkey's got a ways to go yet. I don't know why. They're a little slow. That's okay. Now, what's some of this? No looking for elk today. It's fogged right in. My days are narrowing down for me to take off up north, and I'll be up there for a while. And the snow is flying up there. Oh, and I'll get a. I'll show you a picture of the puppy. <laughs> oh my god, this thing is so cute. It's stupid. And uh, she'll be coming home with me after I'm done hunting up there and visiting friends. Puppies, my first dog ever that I'd call my own dog. Why? Because my life has been a little crazy. We traveled around and going remote for years on end, and I knew I could not have a dog. It'd be, I'd be asking babysitting favors forever, right? But it's time. She's coming home. Now, listen to this. Steve Cujo here. Our police officer friend has written a handful of times. There's an update. Because you asked, and because of the interest in the comments, I'm going to tell you the rest of the story. And this is our op past officer friend who got shot in the head and survived. Thanks for the kind words from you and all who, com all who commented. I'm good now. I still have a lot of pain, but I got all my mobility back. I'm stubborn. Hell, I was back in the gym the day after being released from the hospital. Not doing much. And took gold and silver at the 2009 and 2009 and 2010 Police Olympics bench press competition for my age and weight class. I used to bench over 500 pounds. Holy shit. Anyway, regarding the bullet, it broke the right side of my jaw, broke some teeth, then turned around about 90 degrees and went between my jugular and carotid. Jesus. Still did massive vascular damage, but main artery and vein were intact. It severed my C7 nerve and lots of other nerve damage, then exited on top of my right trap muscle. I was rush, rushed into surgery. Doctors said the blood pooling inside my neck was threatening my airway. They tried to incubate me, but intubate me? But couldn't get those the hose down because of the damage. Holy shit. Doc looked down at me and said, we're gonna have to give you a trach tube. Do you know what that is? And I nodded. He said, don't nod. You have to be awake for this. Do you understand? Oh, gross. I nodded again. Ha <laughs> ha. He gave me a local where he was going to cut and said to others in the room, hold him. He's a power lifter. It's going to take all of you. I then felt two sets of arms on each of my arms, a strap go around my head, and three sets on each leg and started cutting. And he started cutting. Ew. Gross. I felt everything, but I... Didn't try to move. Ew. Doc was having a hard time getting the trach in. Then I felt his fingers go into my neck and he said, okay, I got it. Put him to sleep. I was out. I woke up seven hours later in ICU tied to the bed. I guess I had a bad reaction to the meds and was fighting in my sleep. Doctor showed me the MRI later. Said I had a 50-50 chance when I went into surgery. After breaking after breaking and my jaw, that bullet turned twice. Once to miss my spine and once to miss everything else vital. That bullet took the only path it could have taken for me to survive. I've told that story many times to rooms full of people at police academies and police conferences in an officer survival talk I used to do. But I've only told a few people this next part. For this next part, you need to know I was a mama's boy. I was very close to my mom. We would always sneak up at each other and hug each other from behind when we did. She died in 2001 from cancer. Sorry to hear that, man. Throughout my career, other cops said I was like a cat with nine lives. Three shootings, being shot at, went through a windshield when I crashed my police car. Had a parolee tell me once he was planning to kill me and could have, but something stopped him. He could have too, but that's another story. Found a murder suspect armed with an assault rifle and he just dropped it instead of shooting it out. Things like that happen to me a lot. So, mom dies in 2001 and all these incidents started happening after mom dies, including being shot. Now fast forward to 2010. In 2010, I took a ride on my Harley to the Santa Monica Pier. On that pier, a woman had a table set up for psychic readings. I decided to do it because her sign said, donations only. 
Oops, I just lost my spot. Sorry, guys. And thought, what the hell, you never know. So I sat down and asked her how we start, what information she needs to get started, etc. I never told her my name, what I did for work, nothing. She tells me not to tell her anything, and that if a spirit visited, they would tell her what she needed to know. I agreed, and we just sat and small talked. About five minutes into it, she says, you're a protector, a soldier, or a police officer. Looks over my shoulder. Oh, he's a police officer? There's someone here with us, a woman. 30 second pause, psychic nodding her head, then looks at my face and says, Cujo. She actually called me by my first name here. You can't even see where you were shot in the face. Then looks over my shoulder. Oh, it's under his chin? I still can't see it. She goes on to say my mom was talking to her, standing right behind me, hugging me from behind. She said that my mom is always with me when I'm working. Then my grandma showed up. The psychic said she didn't know who she was and wasn't saying anything, but all she could see was that she was older and was wearing gold boots. The gold boots gave it away. She was very outgoing and wore these a lot. Those a lot. <laughs> she was very outgoing and wore those a lot, and she wore them to my academy graduation right before she died in 93. I've got more stories. Let me know if you want to hear about them. 300 plus pound dude attacked me with a screwdriver and a kitchen knife. Shot him 13 times and only a headshot would stop him. Donut shop was being robbed and we shot it out with the suspect inside the donut shop. Yes, a donut shop. <laughs> uh, there's not too many people that aren't giggling right now. On that note, hey, it was my favorite donut shop. <laughs> I stopped and spoke with the ghost of a Sh Chumash Native American holy man. Pretty sure it was a ghost because he just vanished. That's different. And other cop stories. Keep doing what you're doing, brother. Be careful. I really think you're pissing the government off, so watch your six, Cujo. Thanks, man. Appreciate you. Uh, I really think you're pissing the government off. Watch your six. You know what? I think I'm at the stage of the game right now. The government's really pissing me off. And the rest of the people, they got to start watching their six, I think. F them. All the way to the bank, F them right up the ass. But anyways, that's interesting. You lived a, uh, you've got some crazy ass stories, man, for sure. Many first responders do. I got a lot of friends who are first responders. First responders. The uh, native va vanishing. Definitely want to hear about that one. If you, wanna, if you feel like it one day, man, write us up about, write us back with the one about the native man vanishing that's that's interesting to me and uh yeah you imagine what it must be like you know sometimes i've been still hunting in the in the jungle here on the west coast and, and slipping along as slow deathly slow as you can imagine paralleling the game trails i usually don't walk on trails and uh sometimes i'd picture up ahead and think what it must be like or what it must have been like for our past armed forces guys sneaking through a jungle somewhere and knowing that somebody might be laying right there ready to whack them and how would you know it's almost like the first guy at point is has submitted his life to being the alarm right yeah i couldn't imagine that stress i would never go it i would never move in daylight ever if i had to do something like that i'd be a nighttime guy daytime would just be suicide don't you think but anyways on that note all i'm saying is uh it must be bizarre having somebody shoot at you, right? I've talked to many police officers, like I said earlier, and a lot of them thought I was crazy for being in the woods of grizzly bears, and, and they were just shrugging off the fact that they've been shot at dozens of times. It's like, <laughs> that'd be something else. They'll get the adrenaline going, man. Anyways, I'm glad you're still with us, buddy. And uh, yeah, I want to hear more. Everybody does, for sure. I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna ask you some questions later on about police officers, the training, and the relationship they are pushed to have with the people. Um, I got a lot of questions about that. I'll do that another time, all right, man? Now, moving along. More voices. Let's hear without this one. These are all recent, you guys, all right? A sabe and a centaur sitting. Sitting? That must have been meant sighting. The first story is a short one, but I haven't heard a sab 
of Sabe stories from South Louisiana yet, so here's one. In the early days of the 1930s, our grandparents used to trap Nutra skins for extra money, as Papa's surveying job didn't pay much for a family of five. They would stay for a few days at their camp down in Bayou Sally, which is about two hours southwest below, below New Orleans. And yes, there's land south of New Orleans, and it doesn't just drop off into the Gulf of Mexico like many are surprised to find out, lol. One night, as they were driving down the long gravel road through the woods to get to the camp, Mama saw a big, black, naked, hairy man cross the road in front of the truck. Unfortunately, that's all Mom knew, and I didn't hear about it until years after she'd passed away. My cousin Kirk has a camp in Bayou Sally, and he believes it, though he hasn't seen one. I say yet. Of course, my mom still says it was just a bear in his hind legs. But as you know, experienced trappers like my grandparents would definitely have known the difference between a bear and a naked hairy man, right? The next story is a very bizarre is very bizarre and may be hard for some to believe, but I know the character of the people that told me this story and I trust them. They have no reason to lie. This took place sometime during the 1970s. Two men went out at night in their boat to troll for shrimp as they usually did during shrimping season out in Lake Decade. Trolling for shrimp is a nighttime job and this too was their way of making some extra money for the family. Okay, I'm going to finish this up inside, all right? I'll tell you why in a minute. All right, so I got a, I have a rural neighbor right next door on the next property over. The fence is just off the side of me there. And uh, she has an autistic son, teenage son, and they've had a real bad go at life next door, especially due to the psychopath that used to own this property. Uh, it's really unfortunate. But anyways, they're out and about in their yard, and they can hear me loud and clear. So I thought I better, uh, I'll just come in here and finish up this video not to distract anyone and uh, let them have their normal routine in their yard without having to listen to this kook over here talking to a tree in the, on the other side of the fence, right? So, here we are. But as you know, experienced trappers like my grandparents would definitely have known the difference between a bear and a naked hairy man, right? The next story is very bizarre and may be hard for some to believe but I know the character of the people that told me this story and I trust them. They have no reason to lie. This took place sometime during the 1970s. Two men went out at night in their boat to troll for shrimp as they usually did during shrimping season out in Lake, out in Lake Decad. Sorry, out in Lake Decad. Trolling for shrimp was a nighttime job and this too was their way of making some extra money for the family. Back then there were way more trees around the lake as the land is eroding and trees are also now sparse there. It was around dusk when both men saw the same thing on the bank, half man, half horse, and was looking straight at them. Holy shit. They were so terrified that the owner of the troll boat put it up for sale and sold it. Of course, they were mocked and laughed at, but they knew what they saw. They never went out fishing in a boat at night again, only during the day. Wow. The name of the owner of the boat is John C. He's a friend of the man that told me the story and says John was very serious and didn't care if anyone believed him. They knew what they saw. Accused of drinking, but they never drank when they went out on the boat. I don't know him, but still hoping I get the chance to talk to him so I can tell him about your channel and about all of the people worldwide that have seen the unbelievable. Uh, regarding, the, regarding the man poisoning the water, right, Steve Quayle at stevequayle.com may be privy to helpful information. I've heard that story a great, while, a great while back, but don't remember who reported it. I know that's no help, but I'll try to do some digging and see what I can come up with. I don't want any money if I do find out anything worthwhile. God bless you, Steve. you got big shoulders and a lot of responsibility, no doubt. A real man's man, Miss Robin. Appreciate you, Miss Robin. And uh, yeah, if you can, if that would be great if you found one of those men that's seen that and for them, possibly show them this video maybe or the channel, whatever, to uh, give them the confidence that, that we are no joke here, that everything's taken very seriously and this is about the people and there's no judging here and uh, no cherry picking any shit either, right? The naked hairy man, the secret's out.
The secret's out. The gig's up. The dirty pricks that have uh, made the menu and delivered it, delivered it to the public school system of what we're allowed to learn or not learn. The gig's up, you bastards. Mile 71, Denali Highway. 1977, Denali Road not paved, dirt, just two lanes, and shoulder on each side. My grandpa was caribou hunting with his buddy. Quote, coming around the bend, I slammed on my brakes. Bo yelled, Jagai Yuck, which means monster and Eskimo. We watched you take only two steps while looking at us as it crossed. Because of this, to this day while hunting, I never go alone and bring enough ammo to kill something as big as a bear if I need be. Our, enti our entire family never goes out alone. Short and to the point. Okay, Paul, thanks for that, man. Um, there's no shortage of sightings around there, as you know. As you know. Especially the Yukon. Especially the Yukon section, Alaska Highway. Especially just below Whitehorse, right on the border, right near that the car cross. So many sightings around there. I still got a, I guess I'll get a hold of a buddy. I remember I shared a text a little while ago. My buddy had his friend who texted him to say that him and his wife saw one go across the highway in the Yukon, and his wife's really messed up from it. And the guy's, the husband's reaction was, "Holy shit! So Bigfoot is real." Uh, I think I wouldn't mind getting a hold of them and listening to them and listening to their reaction and what they thought once they had that reality stuffed in their face. It sounds like it's pretty recent, so I'll try to follow up on that today. No shortage up there. No shortage anywhere. Report from Cameroon. Wow. You can call me Keith. I was a missionary living in Africa for many years, raising a family there as we worked with indigenous people groups to translate the Bible into their languages. A lot of our ability to translate the Bible with them was due to our interest in learning their language, languages as well. We did this by having unfocused, wide-ranging conversations with them. Often these moments yielded words and expressions to help us develop our knowledge to a high level. One of our trusted neighbors was telling us about a trip to the forest he had taken. He went to a bend of the Ja River, DJA River in southern Cameroon, an area of swamps and tropical rainforest. He made a shelter that looked like an overturned bowl, formed of sticks, leaves, and vines. He slept in it with a ground fire. His goal was to catch and dry fish to take back to the village. One morning before dawn, he woke up and stirred up the fire. Facing him across the fire was Sasquatch. N-T-W-A-L is the word spelt in his language what they referred to it. I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce that. N-T-W-A-L. A being that they knew as they knew other animals in the forest. In the native language, he asked the Sasquatch in a rebuking tone, quote, Sasquatch, what are you doing here? End quote. Sasquatch responded to my friend by his name, Mbar, Mbor Simon, so that's M-B-O-R Simon. Are you chasing me away? It got up and ran out of the hut. It was in the frickin' hut. He ran through the village shouting, Embor Simon, aren't you going to die? This was a curse. My friend and neighbor said that he had, he had intelligent eyes like a man and arms and legs like a man, except that the upper and lower arms and the thighs and calves were longer than a man's. It had long hair on its body and not fur. He said that Sasquatch spoke in the language of whomever he encountered. To me, this sounds like Sasquatch used mind speech. They knew about the violent side of Sasquatch. He mentioned that there was a Baca pygmy who was assaulted by the Sasquatch. End of story. Well, that's interesting. Okay, Keith, uh, I wouldn't mind hearing some more from that land from those people if you could. If there's any way of digging up some more from around there, that sounds really interesting. Sounds like a group of peoples over there had some intimate knowledge of something that we don't. <laughs> We're getting there, but I know there's a lot of people out there who have a lot more intimate knowledge on this topic than, than we do currently here in North America. Although there's a lot of people here that have it too, but they're not really coming out of the shadows and sharing everything they know that often, although many are.
and babbling. I already got my two copies in me. <laughs> wow. So many. Cameroon, that's a first. Okay, here's another one. It's not that long. Mark is red. It's titled, Strange Encounter. Hi Steve, thanks for your awesome YouTube channel letting the people share. I have a strange encounter that happened when I was about nine years old. Not Sasquatch related, but a very strange encounter with a being of some sort. It happened in the summer. My dad was a roofer and he would wake at 3 a.m. to go to work. Hence, we kids had to go to bed early as he would go to sleep at 6 p.m. Well, my sister, she's seven, and I shared a room on ground floor. We went to bed around 7 p.m. and fell asleep shortly thereafter. The next thing I remember, I'm awoke and standing outside the front door. No, rec no recollection, recollection of getting there. I'm like, okay, what the heck? So I turned around and tried to open the door, and it was locked. I must have locked the doorknob on my way out. Great. It was still light out. I could hear other lucky kids playing outside, still in the distance, and hear a lawnmower. I guess it would have been 9 p.m. on a summer night. My bedroom window was around the corner down the path at the side of the house. So, I proceeded to walk to it and knocked on the window to wake my sister so I could climb in. She woke and let me in. We didn't speak. I climbed in and looked to my bedroom door ajar. We always slept with it closed and saw a small entity peeking around the door jamb. It was two feet tall. It was green and had red eyes. I swear to God I saw this. At this point, I have no idea if my sister saw it, but we literally just closed the window and said nothing to each other and climbed into bed. I did not speak to her about this the next day or ever until about three months ago. We were talking about Bigfoot and spirits. I have strange things happening all the time in my home and have had paranormal teams investigate. Anyways, I mentioned the little green man to her, something like, hey, maybe the little green man is around. She goes, oh my god, you saw that too? When we were kids, it was peeking around the corner of the door. She continued on talking about the little green man, remembering the, about the incident. This happened 30 years ago, and we never spoke of it for that long. I didn't know if she'd seen it or not way back when, but I suspected she did. It was such a revelation to me that she had seen it as well. 30 years. Jeez. I have no idea why we didn't speak on it. We were quiet kids, respectful of our parents, for fear of getting our butts spanked. I remember this day like yesterday, and I think of it often. So glad to have my sister confirm to me that she had seen it as well. Anyways, that's the story. Pretty freaking weird and cool. I don't remember being scared, just so confused why I was outside my door at night and what the little green man was doing there. Kind of reminds me of a missing 411 incident in the making. I did email Dave Plattis about this, but he didn't read it. I guess it's a little too out there for him. LOL. Take it or leave it, but it happened. Have a good one, Steve, and keep the videos coming. My name is Don. Willie, Wiley or Willie, currently live in Maple Ridge, BC, and it happened in Burnaby? No shit. Well, that's not a comp. Well, actually, we've got a lot of emails of people seeing things, beings in their room, right? Or reaching in the window or trying to get them to come out the window, or whatever. There's just too many people report stuff like that to look away, right? So, somebody's going to relate to what, you, what happened. To you and they're gonna say something in the comment section below you watch there's too many people here and there's too much shit going on all right here's another one this is titled stones boulders and tree knocks hello Steve I'll try to keep this brief this sharing is of events that transpired in October 2022 my name is Steven and I live in northern New Brunswick after listening to both yours and Scott Carpenter's sharings, I've come to a bit of an understanding of what to expect from an encounter with the Savvy people. So this is my experience. In early October, I'd done some scouting for a solo camping expedition and decided upon a spot. I lit a fire and was sitting back listening to the sounds of the night. I went to my car for a drink and from out of the darkness, a bunch of small stones and sand impacted my car and instantly I thought, Shit, it's an effing Sasquatch. 
so my fire was small and well contained. I just left. This was my scouting night and I went back about a week or so later deciding to camp in the same spot. I set up camp in the day, had a meal and was having a beer by the fire later that night and in the quiet I heard a boulder impact the pond I was camped beside and I thought holy shit. Well here we go. And that was no tail slap and it may get ugly. I then called out to the pitch blackness and told it to leave me alone that I was observing God's feast of tabernacles and I'm not leaving even if they made me shit my pants. I said to go somewhere else in the millions of acres and just leave me alone. I babbled a tirade of other stuff knowing it, it was there listening. Finally, I said, I'm not leaving. If you want me gone, take it up with God, but I'm staying. It was real quiet for a long time, and I settled in for the night for a blissful night's sleep. <laughs> blissful, huh? <laughs> On the second night after dark, by the fire, I heard another boulder hit the water, followed by two quick tree knocks fairly close by. I pretty much ignored this and stoked the fire, and the rest of that night was uneventful. The next night, I saw a black something, rather big, watching me from across the pond at almost dark. After it got pitch black, I heard three separate and far apart tree knocks. It was probably from three different sabbe, and the noise was far away to closer, and then closer still, but still far away from where I was. On the fourth night, there was a larger black thing across the pond, watching me for an hour or more while I sat by the fire. During this night, I heard the usual night sounds of coyote yelps and wolf howls, as well as the other sounds of the night. The rest of my days and nights were peaceful and uneventful other than that other than just watching the beavers and muskrats pick up the apples I left for them. This is really my first close-up experience but I'm sure that I've felt them out in the bush before. I'd like to thank you for educating me enough to recognize the signs and sounds of when these people are near. I know that you're very busy but if you are ever in New Brunswick coffee or beer and a fire. Thanks for doing, thanks for doing your share for the people. Sincerely Stephen. Okay man thanks for that. Uh, <clears throat> north, just north of Port Elgin, is where uh, Sarah's family is. Where she's from, huge farm, and oh, back behind their property, it's just spruce for miles, right? And then salt water, I guess. But anyway, they had a bright light, absolutely light up the timber back there, in the middle of nowhere in the forest. And the funny reaction, to what she said was, "Yeah, we all just kind of stood there at the back and looked at it, saw it, and like, oh wow, crazy." And they went back inside, and <laughs> that was it. But anyways, we had a handful of other people email in sightings in New Brunswick as well, man. So you're not alone, obviously. And uh, I'm sure somebody from New Brunswick is going to comment in the section below what shit they've seen too, right? And the wolves. You, see, you heard wolf sounds? Um, I haven't looked into it, but I, I'm i not familiar if there's wolves in New Brunswick or not. I guess there must be. The ship house a moose. Seems wherever there's moose, there's wolves, right? But anyway... Thanks for the email, man. Appreciate it. <laughs> Be careful out there. Listen to your, listen to the voice inside. If it ever tells you to leave, you better follow that voice inside. All right. What do we got here? I go one more. One more. I get my butt going. I got lots of shit to do so I can get out of here and head to the freezing frickin' north and and uh, get into my routine. My Weird Encounters and Events. Hi Steve, I sent my stories to you two plus years ago. I've not seen you read them or have read your book yet. You have read a couple other stories I've sent you. My Six-Toed Prince and Being Trapped in My Kayak in a Waterfall. I remember that story. So yes, you're welcome to continue using my name, George Williams Sr. I think your son's email is too, hasn't he? Faller? Are you a faller, I think? Logger? Let me start in the beginning. Age around 14, I was walking along a water ditch line up in the Sierra Mountains west of Lawson Volcanic Park. As I was walking, I became aware of matching footfalls crunching in the underbrush, just 20 to 30 feet up the hill from me. The timber at the time and area was thick with heavy understory. So, most of the time, you could only see a half a dozen feet into the bush. The footfalls got still and silent. And I noticed that every time I stopped to listen, the footfalls would stop with me, sometimes taking one extra step if I stopped suddenly. 
This continued for about a mile or so, and at that time I was thinking it was a cougar. When I got about a quarter mile from where I was staying, I lost my nerves and bolted. I ran all the way back to the house, but I never heard the footsteps following. Counter number two. I was grown by this time in my mid-twenties. I'd been following timber professionally for about six years. I was working on the bottom of a yarder block, jack timber, up, up the hill into the unit. I was walking on a medium-sized Douglas fir, jacking it up. When a gust of wind hit the top of the tree, broke it off its hinge, backwards off the stump. The tree fell out of the unit down the hill, falling into the reprod. Reprod, that's a regrowth. That was planted so thick, the trees were about 20 feet tall, and you couldn't see two feet in. The wall of the planted trees was maybe 20 to, three, 20 to 30 feet away. When the tree hit the ground, something screamed loud enough to shake my body through and through. It bolted downhill like a big elephant smashing through the timber, all the while screaming in what sounded like a cross between a chimpanzee and a hyena, rapid and un indistinguishable. I listened to this as it ran away. The sound faded out as this thing got maybe a mile down the canyon. Holy shit. That'd be something else to hear. I was driving home from work on a logging road. I took an alternative route to avoid the log trucks on the haul road. I rounded a corner that turned I rounded a corner that turned me facing the draw about 200 yards ahead. I saw a brown hairy thing running up the dry wash across the road and disappeared up the hill in the woods. I noticed some branches that had passed as I was driving towards it. When I got to the spot where I crossed the road, those branches that passed by were so high off the ground I had to use my axe fully extended at arm's length, standing and stretching as high as I could just to reach them, and I'm five foot nine. Number four, I was working east of a small town in California called La Porte. One day after work, I took a drive down the back logging roads deep into the mountains. I came upon a cave slash gold mine on the side of the road. I stopped and walked up to the entrance. It was blocked by a pool of water about 15 feet across and unknown how deep. Being young and adventurous, I decided to get my flashlight and go exploring. But as I stood at the mouth of this cave, I was overcome with such a fear of dread, I can't even explain it. I've never felt fear like that before or since. Needless to say, I just turned around and left. Number five, I was living in a cabin. And my landlord lived up the hill a couple hundred yards from my house. They were conducting some church meetings in town an hour away. And they asked me to light their wood stove and fireplace when I came home from work so their house would be warm when they got there, much later. This was in late November, so the sun set very early. It was a moonless night and pitch black. All you could see was dark blue night sky and stars, the treetops silhouetted against the sky. Below that black, so black you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. I pulled up in their driveway, and of course they gave me a key to their back door so I had to walk around in the dark. I was met by their key shound, key shound, Smokey. She walked beside me as I followed the walkway around the back, navigating by referencing my position from the silhouette of the roof line. When I was about to step on the back step, I was stopped dead in my tracks. Something growled at me and it was close. I could hear Smokey's nails clicking down the concert walkway. I think that was probably a concrete, a concrete walkway, as she silently ran away, leaving me alone. At that point, this thing growled again, and it was so close to my face in the dark that I could feel its hot breath on my face. That would absolutely suck. As the sound literally shook my core, I calmly and slowly turned around and walked away. When I got around the corner of the garage, I ran the last 25 feet to my car and jumped in. I used to think it was a bear, but a bear that close to me probably would have stopped my, slapped my face off my skull. Number six, six-toed visitor. Steve, you read this story about a year ago, so I won't tell it here. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> excuse me, number seven. 
my wife, brother, and sister-in-law decided to float down Battle Creek. I'm going to make this one very short. Nevertheless, we came across two very large footprints in the sand. They came out of the water, across the sandbar, then back into the water. The prints were those classic Bigfoot kind of prints, about 18 to 20 inches long, 8 inches wide at the ball, 5 inches at the heel. Sunk 2 inches in the sand and looked maybe less than a couple hours old. Edges sharp and crisp with a compression mound in the middle of the tracks. My footprint was stomping in the sand could only produce a quarter inch deep print. Number eight. This may not be an encounter, but is definitely on the weird side and one that should have ended me. I was falling timber near Covallo Round Valley Indian Reservation. I worked my way up to the ridge line, fighting my way through the mountain lilac. It was so thick, it was like a wall of brush about 8 10 feet high. I fell a fir tree side hill towards the down sloping ridge. About 40 feet out was a small oak tree. That, around 12 feet up, had a kink in it. That, that bent it down slope on a 30 degree elbow. I figured I would lay the fir in just about it. I figured I would lay the fir in just about it to keep it from rolling down the hill. As I sent the tree, I saw that it was drifting downhill a little and would center punch that oak. I dropped my saw and started scrambling up the hill through the brush. I was maybe 10 feet from the stump, clawing my way on my hands and knees, not getting very far, when I looked over my shoulder. The tree I cut hit the oak at around 40 feet, pulled the butt of the stump like a giant teeter-totter. The butt of the tree swung over my head and came down. The only thought that flashed through my mind was they're going to find a wet spot and my close, my big typo there, about three feet over my head while still on my hands and knees. This tree stopped in midair and it just hung there. Then painfully slow it moved over my body, past my boots. When it cleared my feet, boom, it hit the ground. <laughs> Ooh. Steve, I can say, Steve, I cannot say with any absoluteness that I have seen a Sasquatch, but I can say I've had some weird shit happen to me, much of which I've had, I have no explanation for. God bless. You keep on keeping on. Sorry for the repeat, but I thought maybe someone might want to hear this again. Sincerely, George Williams Sr. Okay, man, appreciate it. Yeah, the falling incident. Holy shit. I know a lot of loggers. And every one of you guys has got some kind of shit-eating, almost bit of story. And sadly, a lot of people have their story ended with logging, right? But anyway, uh, I know there's a shit pile of loggers listening to these emails. I know that for a fact. And I also know that a lot more loggers have been coming forward. And I think it's, it's obviously this, people talking is helping helping people get past that uncomfortable barrier, right? Especially you loggers. Anybody that works out in the, in the timber, in the hills. Um, I would love to hear a lot from a lot more loggers because I know there's who knows how many more of you are listening. You're probably not even admitting to your coworkers you're listening to this channel. And you either know something, seen something, heard something, somebody told you something, and uh, you're not sharing it. So, share it. I'm sending out a I'm sending out a request to all of you people who are employed in in the mountains and the forests, especially you loggers, the ones you hard asses that don't want to admit shit. That's fine. I, I get it. I don't give a shit if you don't if you don't want to admit or, or add your name. I don't care. It's okay. But email me. Email me. Use an alias. I don't give a shit. I want to know what you guys know. I want to hear what you guys have seen and what you know. All right? So, and I know there's a bunch. You know, my uh, First Station superhero friends, ladies, uh, my friend made it back home from the hospital. Thank God. She still needs prayers. She can help her heart get stronger. But uh, they told me that there was an area near where they grew up where the loggers would not go. They went there to attempt to log it off, and then they said, no, we're not doing it. Uh-uh. All 100% due to the Sasquatch experiences, whatever's going down, that is 100% why they never did it, and they won't do it, 
and then we'll go back there. And I wonder how many of those guys are following this channel, watching and listening. And that area was near, not too far from Kennedy Lake, also not too far from uh, Nement, right around that area. I also ran into a young guy, Patrick Canada, who was working out around there. And uh, he came up to me at the gas station, Patrick Canada, just down the road. Knew who I was, followed the channel, he said to me flat out, he's working out there, and that's all I thought about all day long, <laughs> was these beings, right? And I noticed a shit pile of activity going on around those hills, those mountains over there. And uh, anyway, getting back to you loggers. I know there's a bunch of you that are holding on to some, some experiences, and I want to hear it, all right? So don't share your name, just share what you know. Anyway, it's enough babbling for me. I'm not relaxed. I've got too much on the mind. I'm getting close to the pinch time where I'm, I've really got to start packing and get my shit together. So I got to get going and get my mandatory chores done here and, uh, and get out of here. So I can't wait to share emails from the middle of nowhere again. That's where I'm supposed to be <laughs> doing this. Not inside. It sucks being inside. Talk to you shortly. Thank mm -hmm. you.